Welcome back to Generals and Napoleon, episode 53, The Battle of Vimero and the Controversial Convention of Sintra. We have a very special guest because it is the anniversary of the Battle of Vimero, and we have our good friend Marcus Cribb joining once again. Hello, Marcus. Hello, and hello, everyone. Thanks again for having me back. Yeah, my pleasure. I love your intro voice. It's way better than mine, I must say. Um, oh, I, I, don't, I don't agree. I think uh, we're introing up on each other. It's great. We're on our <laughs> roll. We're raising each other's game. I like it. Um, yeah, we're talking about a battle. Um, we, we just touched on the Battle of Rolica or Rolisa uh, a few days ago. And this is more, this is like part two of that battle, wouldn't you say? Yeah, it really does follow on uh, very quickly from uh, Relitha, or um, yeah, apart, apologies always for my terrible Portuguese pronunciation, <laughs> um, but it, it does follow on very, uh, very quickly, just uh, four days later, uh, and it's on the same campaign, but it's actually quite a bigger scale of battle. Uh, right. Relitha was the first uh, kind of pitch battle victory for the British. Wellesley, who becomes Wellington, goes on the, the attack up several hills. Uh, Vimero is very different in style of and, and size as well. Okay. Yeah, and um, we were talking earlier before we came on, and, and you know, we'll, we'll jump into the battle in just a minute, but the almost rarely is the aftermath of a battle more interesting than this one, don't you think? Yeah, this one gets very controversial with the Convention of Sintra. We will uh, definitely touch on uh, in depth at the end, but uh, it, it defines it quite different uh, points here. And it's going to be one of those ones that we often find uh, Wellesley Wellington, he, he has some fantastic victories and he's always nearly like frustrated at the last moment that something happens that he doesn't <laughs> roll forward and is able to have that total victory and right. we've already been recording a few of these battle ones um, and Salamanca uh, being one of them yep. and he's just got that uh, French rear guard action and uh, Vittoria we've talked about before and there's some of the looting and, and bits like that so is this is another case that and it's a bit more complicated this one but he doesn't get his total victory that he, he needs and it's one of the reasons that the Peninsula War does drag on for quite a while. Indeed, indeed. Well, just to give uh, my audience some background, um, the battle occurred mm. August 21st, 1808. Uh, Vimero, I believe, was along the coastline of Portugal, correct? Yeah, it's actually very close to the uh, coast. The, um, the, the sea, the shoreline is um, basically a stone's throw away. And mm -hmm. the background to this is after, you know, almost during and after um, Battle of Reitha, the the British uh, reinforcements are coming ashore. Mm -hmm. um, so the Royal Navy and transport ships have um, brought the army uh, down from the uh, from England and Ireland, and they're rowing ashore um, from those uh, warships and transport ships. And there's actually a few cases that some of the ships are uh, the boats, sorry, are knocked over into the surf, and there's a few there's a few drowning. But um, they they're kind of arriving, and it's really bolstering an expeditionary force into a, a proper army now, pushing up to about fifteen thousand men. Mm -hmm. And on the other side, we have uh, one of Napoleon's best friends and oldest uh, military buddies, General Junot, who's gathered about 14,000 French for this battle. Yeah, so the, just a few less than the British, so, um, but again, quite comparable armies. You know, yes. they, they're similar in that ballpark figure. And uh, yeah, General Junot, you know, capable commander. Uh, yes. he's, he's been in the uh, field of Portugal for a little while now since he's marched into Lisbon. And uh, yeah, it's, it's quite comparable here. And the having the sea nearby does start to change a few things because whilst he's now not able to get the initiative and go on the attack, he's got to defend that because more troops are coming in. Right. And just some background, as you know, he's unquestionably brave. He's fought with Napoleon in Italy and Egypt. Uh, He's sustained several head wounds, so he's, he's been at the front lines quite a bit. Um, he's no tactical genius like Devu or Sultz. He's more of a, I would say more of a, a slugger like a Ney or a Udino. Just kind of march up, you know, put him in column and launch him against the British. Yeah, we, we, we see that now, basically. <laughs> yeah, there's, a, right. there's a lot of columns of attack coming. Yeah. Uh, and Wellesley's actually got something hanging over his head as a, as a point of interest, that his... 
his replacement has actually arrived um, that day, uh, mm-hmm. Sir Harry Burrard. Mm-hmm. And he's on uh, HMS Brazen, sitting out there on the sea, as I was saying, it's really nearby. And he's staying there on the, they're basically in the captain's cabin because uh, it's comfortable. And he's agreed that he's actually not going to replace uh, Wellesley until the 22nd of August. Uh-huh. So uh, as, as, the, as the battle's forming, Wellesley knows that he's got one day left in the top job. Right. And on the other side, um, I was reading the French marched all night uh, just to get to the battlefield. So they're already probably tired. I know Junot is allegedly drunk and um, <laughs> his attacks kind of show that uh, they're kind of sloppily coordinated. But um, yeah, let's jump into the battle. Um, so I want to talk about and it's very big in Napoleonic warfare, skirmishing and skirmishers. Can you kind of right. talk to us about what that is and why that's important? Absolutely, happily to. Skirmishers, um, they'll break down into kind of three types as well. Uh, so you will have regiments of light troops, uh, which in turn break down into two for the uh, British um, and kind of one for the, the French and their allies. Mm-hmm. Um, so you will have uh, light infantry regiments, which are not actually a brand new thing. Many people think they are. And it doesn't just come from the uh, American Revolution. It has been developed over time. Uh, it's it's always been tied and trest- tested and then kind of has a peak with certain armies and then dives back down. But uh, we certainly see certain, some nations, uh, especially some of the Germanic nations, keep a good uh, amount of them. Uh, they, can, they can be there in a battalion strength or line regiment uh, and then one company of them. So for the British, that's one in 10 companies. And for the French, it changes, but it's typically one in six companies are then designated as light troops. And then you mm-hmm. also have your, your grenadiers as well. Mm-hmm. So those light troops, they're trained um, to have a little bit more initiative. Yeah, so they were typically thought um, thought to be a bit shorter. And actually, the archive records have shown it's on average true, um, right. about an inch. Um, but it's not a massive difference. The main thing is that actually they were picked for a level of intelligence as well. And mm-hmm. that left led to independent thinking. So, so they, they were trained to like think for themselves, which is not typical, as you know. Right. So it was kind of a like a shoot and scoot. There was no like lines of uh, firing lines. They were kind of moving around, taking shots where they could. Yeah. And what's really uh, interesting is they, they were trained mostly to work in pairs or work down to pairs. They could, they could fight in line like normal troops. They could work in a, a squad or a detail that's smaller. Right. And those whole squads can move and cover each other, or they could be like one's firing and one's reloading and moving, which is actually very similar to modern day, like NATO tactics. Right. right. Uh, and that works well, because then hopefully what the, whoever you're fighting against, one of them's ducking and stuff like that. And the other one can, you can have an effect. You can move, you can shoot. I, yeah. And I was reading about it. Um, there's a great quote that I want to get in here. And it said, to, yeah. quote, to counter the French skirmishers, Brigadier General Fain, Detached four companies of riflemen, the 60th Regiment of Foot, and the 95th Rifles. These outnumbered and outfought the French skirmishers who fell back to the sides of the brigade column. Without their skirmishers in front of them, the French column blundered into the 945 men of the 50th Regiment. At 100 yards or 91 meters, the British formed in a two deep line and opened fire. So I think, like, I think usually when the French were countering, you know, they were attacking the Prussians or Russians who kind of just stood in line and took it. I think the the British were able to set, see off the uh, skirmishers and, and get to the main part of the French army. Yeah, and that's what happens here. So the the French are actually very good at skirmishing, and they actually tend to use more troops than the British and put out a mass amount. And then you end up with a battle within a battle with the skirmishers, as you know, if the British are defending a position and the French are coming on, the French skirmishers coming out, the British, you're, it sometimes depicts a really loose, wavy line, uh, but they'll be out there. They'll be trying to get round because that has a massive effect because they can get round the back or push forwards or push back. So you end up with like a, a, a prequel to the main fighting. Mm-hmm. And um, the, one of the depictions I've best seen written was about like the French column coming on with like an angry swarm of bees around them. And that's the French skirmishers. Mm-hmm. What happens here is... The British um, are able to force their skirmishers back. So then they're firing against the main body of the column, 
which instantly starts to cause disruption. You know, you've got your, your officers and your NCOs at the front and the sides. If they're starting to be wounded and killed, then they've got less control over the, the body of men. And also it's things like um, morale is going to be affected because the columns being taking casualties. Right. And I think another interesting aspect that I, I want to mention is both commanders wanted to fight this battle as soon as possible because Junel was worried about the British linking up with Sir John Moore's army. And I think Wellington was worried about this Burrard guy taking over his, his, you know, like you said, he's being replaced. So I think they were both kind of in a rush to get this battle on. Yeah, there is. There's a time element to this. You know, Juno's um, met up uh, with um, a, a secondary force here and under General Delaborde, who was at Relitha. Right. And uh, yeah, Wellesley, Wellington uh, is going to get replaced. He's only got this day. Uh, so, um, but he he is waiting. You know, he's not actually gone out and uh, and fought this battle. He's found a good position, and it's two long ridges, and uh, both those ridges have got loads of walls and vineyards on them. So it will break up that French attacking column. Yeah, yeah. Let's talk about kind of what happens here. So, um, looks like it's just the uh, attacking column as usual, marching against the British line, and uh, uh, they're just beaten back, from what I can tell. Yeah, um, it, it short, the shortest version of the answer. Yes, that's what absolutely what happens. <laughs> um, so um, they do. The the French come on. Uh, they come on in column, and uh, as you said, you know, Juno's pushed them overnight, and they're getting uh, quite tired. And the British skirmishers have quite an effect upon that as they go in. Um, however, there's there's multiple columns of attack as they're coming up. It's not just the one. The British skirmishers. Uh, have that and then they pull all the way uh, back in mm. and actually some of the british positions such as the 90 97th queen's german regiment and the 52nd light infantry actually fall out onto the uh, french flanks uh, so then they're having that um, effect there of firing onto multiple sides of the french attacking columns mm. as they're coming in and actually the, this is followed up and followed up onto like tommy air's column uh, with the uh, 50th Regiment coming afoot. And actually, men like General Delaborde are actually wounded at this point. So the, there's, this is just actually the first of a few attacks, but they, um, Juno's separated his army out into multiple columns, and the first one's going in really under Delaborde, and that's pushed back. Yeah, and then I think Juno is either frustrated or, like I said before, drunk, and he just keeps, looks like sending in troops, that is like he's sending in reserves, and Wellington saw mm. a reserve that he hasn't even used yet. So I think it's, I think that kind of says it all. Like uh, Juno is just throwing men against the wall and hoping they'll break through. Yeah. I mean, I think Juno's not had the experience of um, pushing against British troops. So he's expecting uh, what happens, you know, m many armies is the, the French are very good with their columns and their Elan, their, yeah. uh, their spirits. And they, mm. they come in with the, the pass the charge and the rat -a tat tat and everyone chanting. And uh, that body of men forces their way up, and that that's not happening. And yeah, there's there's certainly notes of Juno's frustration. Right. Uh, Want to make a podcast? Spotify has got a platform that lets you make one super easily, then distribute it everywhere, and even earn money, all in one place for free. It's called Spotify for Podcasters, and here's how it works. Spotify for Podcasters lets you record and edit podcasts right from your phone or computer. So no matter what your setup is like, you can start creating today. Then you can distribute your podcast to Spotify and everywhere else podcasts are heard. Video podcasts are also available on Spotify. Yeah, just an interesting, interesting battle. It is, and he, um, he has to push in his reserves. So what he's done is he's actually uh, grouped together lots of his grenadiers and uh, he's formed them up into regiments and they're pushing now in. So he's committed them. So grenadiers are meant to be uh, your tallest, toughest men and he's holding them back and they they go in on a different ridge. Uh, the British reposition uh, to meet the second attack. Uh, the skirmishers come in and then the British artillery can fire down upon them. Mm. Uh, and what's worthy of note about uh, Vimero is this is the first battle uh, where shrapnel is fired. Oh, yes. Yes. Let's talk about uh, good old General Shrapnel here. Um, yeah. This is a, he was a, a British officer and he came up with, instead of just, you know, regular cannonball, it was like an exploding shell, correct? 
Yeah, so they'd already had a few different versions of this, which was um, like canister, case shot. Um, so what would happen is it would just have a, basically a hollow cannonball with loads of gunpowder in it, and it would blow up overhead. Mm. Um, and that would just be, if you just thought of like ripping parts of the side of a tennis ball or something, just have big chunks of that flying. Right. And, you know, if you caught that, that would rip off limbs, body, heads, all sorts of nasty wounds. But it's only going to be in a certain number of like big chunks. Right. What Shrapnel did is he managed to find the right thickness of that where you could fill it with effectively a type of musket ball mm -hmm. and still get the, the right ratio of the outside being dense and not breaking and, and still getting enough explosive in there mm -hmm. and that kind of ratio if you think of almost like the core of the the planet the kind of ratio of the the magma and the the shell casing and the little um crust of the earth around us that then actually led to very deathly like mathematics of a payload of musket balls right and if it was fired downwards at the right angle it then created a cone effect like a overhead light or something that'd be shining down and as that comes down you want it to fire just at the right overhead too too far and there'd just be musket balls flying off as the distance if it was on the downward trajectory it would give a cone of death going down towards and it's very effective against the column where men are packed densely together yeah, I just did an, uh, uh, an episode in General Foy, and he was, um, yes. I think it was Orthez, he was behind his line of troops, but a shrapnel shell burst, it went over the line, but it burst overhead, and the shard like went down into his shoulder from overhead. Yeah, I mean, and that's the other thing, I, I, was, yeah, I was just listening to you, your Foy one uh, the other day, and yeah, it, it creates that kind of uncertainty that you're expecting shot to come in against your front and then it's mm -hmm. suddenly off in the rear or off to the sides or yeah. it's basically ignoring a lot of cover you, you you hide behind a wall actually it's coming down pretty much straight overhead it's like a, a top secret um, thing we, you know we don't actually give it to our allies uh, initially mm -hmm. and certainly the french don't have it they've still got um a they've still got a case shot so they have they will have overhead explosions and things but it's not having that same uh, that the British have got. So it's it's cutting edge technology in 1809. Yeah, indeed. Indeed. And um, so the battle's kind of raging. Uh, I know there's a flanking attack by Kellerman that's kind of seen off. Um, and where is Barrar? Is he off of his boat yet? Is he making his way to the battlefield to take credit for this victory? Towards yeah, uh, not not to a bit later, um, okay. but he he's not actually involved in in the fighting on this. Uh, there's a second there's a second attack that goes in. There's a third attack um, that goes in, and Wellesley's managing that. Uh, he once the third attack uh, fails, he sends his cavalry uh, men like the twentieth light dragoons, mm -hmm. uh, and actually it's, it's one of the other few times apart from at Waterloo and uh, Salamanca. Apparently, he starts taking his hat off and waving and getting quite jubilant. Mm -hmm. um, and what I love about this cavalry charge is he's got a really small detachment of the Lisbon Mounted Police, are attached <laughs> to his army, and they go in. Um, and in my head, I just have like, do you remember Due South on TV? Yeah. With the, with the Mounties, I've just yeah. got them in my head. The Canadian <laughs> Mounties just going for it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, they they go in. Um, they attack the the French. They get counterattacked by the French dragoons, uh, and then they manage to uh, pull back in. in like with quite a daring escape um, mm -hmm. was the uh, the French really come in and hammer them. So there's, there's, a, there's in the middle of this all, you've got multiple attacks of um, columns, uh, shrapnel now firing, skirmishes, but also cavalry on cavalry action. So it, this is not a big battle by all, all amounts, you know, 15,000 men aside, give or take, but it's got all the elements of a kind of a, quite a classic Napoleonic battle here. Right, right. Um, well, let's talk casualties uh, real quick, because I do want to touch on the convention of Sintra. Mm -hmm. um, on the French side, it looks like it's about 2,000 killed, wounded, captured, and 13 cannons lost. And the British side is very light, isn't it? Yeah, the British casualties, I think, is about 700 killed, wounded, and captured. So um, in that, a, a lot less. I think yeah. it's kind of caused the, the French end up with a fourth attack and they come around a flank and the British manoeuvre to get that. So they've seen off multiple columns uh, by this point. Uh, so they are doing um, a defensive action, which gives a bit of an advantage. They can use the cover. Uh, their you know, cannon are actually very well positioned, going far down a, a gentle slope. Uh, so, yeah, the, the French casualties are quite substantial. And as they force back... Um, 
they lose leave quite a few cannons behind so yeah 13 cannon there as well now it could have been worse right i i, I believe Brard calls a halt or something or stops the pursuit which i think is yeah madness. yeah effectively <laughs> yeah the um the Barad kind of arrives basically right at the the end of the battle and goes okay I, it's now my command thank you very much you know arthur for, for fighting the battle <laughs> right. um i'll take over now right um and that that kind of i've seen one of the quotes is being like muzzling wellington just as he wants to to head up you know he's got he's got very light casualties right um, as a point of note i i found that actually one of the lisbon mounted police a cadet um dies um out of them all um oh. just to break down the casualties a bit yeah um, but the uh, yeah he get wellington gets pulled back at that moment and this is his frustration that we see time and time again i've i mentioned it about salamanca and vittoria two of the big ones uh but uh we and you know waterloo is completely different kettle of fish because uh the casualties are very high but he's kind of ready to go on and barad's like well i've just arrived properly i'm now in command i want to kind of take and to be fair to him you know he wants to take um picture of the situation yeah fine but the situation is follow on release cavalry troops to you know that can um you know double time march forward and start capturing french units that are in dis um you know disorganization so yeah. that doesn't happen and yeah. uh, Burard, i think should be a little bit berated for that and actually he is uh now replaced within 24 hours by sir hugh dalrymple so yeah. it doesn't take long but for the big, one, for it... one two three change the Barad one is, I kind of understand, like he hasn't been there all day, so maybe he's a little bit worried that the French have a reserve and they're walking into a trap. But if, if you know, he wasn't there all day. So for him to show up, take command and say, oh, we're not doing a pursuit, I, I just find that somewhat ludicrous. But uh, but yeah, yeah, and then Dal Rimple shows up, uh, who takes over. It's just strange. I don't know what happened with this chain of command here. No, I think it's the quick changeover. Um, you know, uh, Wellesley, um, Burrard and Dalrymple, by having it in quick succession in like kind of 24 hours, three different commanders, it creates that uncertainty of not wanting to, to do anything too drastic mm. if I was being kind to them. But I definitely think um, Burrard and Dalrymple went down the wrong course of action. Mm. And then they, you know, call the convention of Sintra if you want to. <laughs> Yeah, segue into that nicely. Yeah. It gets it get it takes a bit of a turn, doesn't it? Yeah, let's talk about the diplomacy here and, and the I guess the peace treaty. The French are decisively beaten. There's no escape, so they enter into treating with the British, and they send General Kellerman, who's you know the son of the Marshal Kellerman, smart guy, very good cavalry mm. leader. And who's he meeting with? The three generals. He meets with three generals, um, but it's being led by uh, Dalrymple here for the yeah. for the British. Now, and I know this is very European, but I guess the language of negotiations or diplomacy is French, but they don't know that General Kellerman can also speak English, correct? Yeah, so I think we end up with a, a strange moment here that um, Dalrymple to his subordinates, which uh, in, includes a whole host, uh, but inclu includes Wellesley, in includes Berard, um, they, they kind of take off to the side and they they start talking openly in English and mm -hmm. Kellerman basically can just openly eavesdrop to them. And quite smart for him is he doesn't let on that he, he can speak English and quite, <laughs> he had no reason to. So he just kind of sits there and be like, oh, yeah, you have your quiet moment in the corner, but I basically just listening in to the whole conversation. Uh, the, and then the, the treaty that's written and agreed upon, I uh, even with, Kellerman's uh, inside knowledge there is just unbelievably in favor with him. You're almost a victory to the French. Right. All right. Well, let, let's go over that because then we can talk about how ridiculous it is. So the French get to the, they surrender, they surrender their army, but they get to return to France with all of their loot, all of their equipment and guns, basically everything they came into Portugal with. Correct. Yeah, but it gets worse. Um, so <laughs> not, not only are all the troops returning to France, not only are they taking all of the loot that they've stolen from the Portuguese, but they agree that the Royal Navy is going to transport them back to France. Right. With, without a parole of one year or anything like that. 
No, yeah, so normally there's like an agreement that they won't fight for a year or, you know, they might exchange some officers as an, as a kind of an assurance as, uh, there. But it's basically like, oh, we'll give you a taxi ride home. <laughs> uh, so, and, and, and I read there's... that like within a week, those same soldiers are marching back into Spain. Yeah, I think they basically land in the south of France. They're like given a good meal and a new pair of shoes probably and head yeah. back over the Pyrenees. That's just... Um, the, there's a terrible moment as well where um, the the French are marching onto Royal Navy ships and the Loyalist Italian Legion. Uh, I can't remember if we've covered them yet. So they are Portuguese troops who don't take part in this fighting. They were mostly up in the hills, being led by British officers, who uh, they're, they're some of the first troops to basically evacuate Portugal during Juno's invasion, head to Britain. Uh, armed and trained very quickly by the British and headed into Portugal to lead a bit of an irregular warfare and kind of a bit of a, a resistance plus. They they guard the port against the Portuguese. So there's Portuguese troops making sure the Portuguese don't start to lynch the French as they see the French marching, you know, with knapsacks full of silver paintings, stolen right. items. Right. In my head, you can imagine someone saying like, well, that's that's my candlestick. I want it yeah. back. <laughs> that's know? our gold and jewels that you're taking. Yeah. 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 So it, that's how just ridiculous it gets. Yeah. Um, French and Sinto is, is a very poorly uh, written document. So for those reasons, uh, Darimple, Burrard and Wellesley are recalled to Britain to explain uh, the convention of Sintra. Yeah, and you make a good point uh, in your blog uh, on dukeofwellington.org. Um, by the time, you know, uh, Burrard and Dalrymple were admonished for the convention of Sintra, uh, it would be too late for Wellington to help Sir John Moore and Karuna, which would cost them thousands of men and lives. You know, it, it, would, it was too late for them to get back to Portugal and Spain to help Sir John Moore by that time. Yeah, sadly so. The the timeline, you know, the the journey to sail back to Britain and obviously he had to explain themselves in London um, meant that Corona and, you know, Sir John Moore was having to have his own independent operation effectively. Um, what's quite telling, though, is all three men are admonished, actually quite surprisingly, but uh, Burrard and Dalrymple never hold proper command again. They're given like local garrisons and honorary positions. Right. Whereas Sir Arthur Wellesley um, is turned back around uh, in the spring of 1809 and heads back out uh, to Portugal, which would then lead to the, the Porto campaign. Right. So, and then from the Porto campaign, you get Talavera. And from there, then you get him becoming, you know, uh, Wellington as such, Lord Wellington. So, um, he, he, he not, they all are, are cleared on paper, but only one of them gets command again, and he, you know, becomes the Duke of Wellington effectively from there. He doesn't, he doesn't head home. This is his his one bit of actual. If it's not even rest of recuperation, um, but this is his one journey back home in the whole of the Peninsular War as well as a point of note for uh, Wellesley. Right, and on the flip side, although Napoleon was probably furious that his, you know, his you know, undefeated soldiers lost another battle to the British. He was probably somewhat happy with this convention of Citra to get so much in return. Yeah, and I, I would think he'd be probably a bit surprised. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well... <laughs> kind of pleased in a way, going, well, you, you've lost the battle, but I've got my army back. And yes, you've been pushed out of Portugal by this time, but now we can, we're, we've got troops in Spain. So when you march back into Spain, it frees me up to push troops further back into Portugal, which is what happens. There's a now another invasion of Portugal under Soult. Right. And I mentioned it in my episode on General Foy, who fought at both Vimero and Corona. It must have been mind-blowing to him. Like five months earlier, I'm on a ship being sent back to France because we had just lost. And then five, five months later, we're winning and pushing the English off at Corona. Like it must have been, he probably couldn't believe it. No, and I'd love to know what's going through those uh, those men's head for the French kind of going. We've been defeated, but uh, actually we're being sent back to France. Mm -hmm. We're not going to a prison hulks, you know. And uh, worthy of note, talking about you know prisoners in the Napoleonic War, um, the officers had quite a nice lifestyle. Sometimes uh, right. what happened is they were like paroled into a, a town within the home nation, France and Britain. So you see them going around. They had to uh, report back to a certain house most evenings. Uh, they, sometimes they could openly carry their swords. Uh, they would 
they, there was the chance to escape. They're given their word not to, but um, certain people of character did. Um, but the men were put under quite hard labour. So uh, in Britain, for example, a lot of the French, they actually dug out Portsmouth Harbour. Uh, so if any of you go to visit like, somewhere like uh, HMS Victory and the whole dockyard and you, you stand on the deck of like our, the nearby neighbour, HMS Warrior, and you look into Portsmouth, but well, at the time it was just like a wide river. Mm -hmm. they, they sent thousands of French prisoners with a shovel and dug that harbour out. And then uh -huh. every evening they were put on like an old ship in really tight conditions. And so men are dying of like, exhaustion disease malnutrition yeah so it's not a nice fate prisoners then you know you're not just going to sit out the war uh, right. really right or, or be returned in luxury like they were in the convention of Sintra. yes you know? yeah. I, I don't know of any case where it's like that getting back to the convention of Sintra, uh probably the worst peace treaty ever or one of the worst <laughs> that was ever put together at least in british history yeah and i think actually it's got to be up there as like Great military blunders, actually. You know, this is not a battle, but it's certainly uh, a massive kind of. How oh, can we go as far as defeat? Or can we just we can just call it a massive mistake that Britain yeah. managed to do, and it was it was scorned by many, um, and it 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 really baffles the mind as to what they were thinking. Uh, was it just oh, well, if we push the French back to France, we we'll, you know we're getting rid of them quicker. Um, we're being honourable gentlemen. I'm trying to think of the excuses they would have come up with, but um, yeah, maybe, maybe Kellerman up. bluffed them that they had more troops in reserve that the British right. didn't know about. Or, yeah, you wonder what what the discussion was. Yeah, it would. It's one of those fly on the wall situations that you'd love to have. Yeah, indeed. But um, yeah, Battle of Amaro, I think, is very interesting. Um, you know, the battle itself. You know, uh, the British held their line as they usually do, and. Uh, you know, saw the French off, uh, and then the the aftermath is just fascinating. I just wish we could, um, yeah, like you said, be a fly in the wall for those conversations. Yeah, and the, my my other one is because when I wrote this off as uh, one of my original articles, I did say you know seeing them off in the same old fashion for the set, yep. first time. Yep. Um, but actually, Wellesley has quite a dynamic. We we simplified it because it's hard to do without a map, and we've said that with the, the with the podcast. You know, it's, it'd be great if yeah, everyone had a map in front of them. But right. actually, he's quite dynamic. He does move units, especially like the third and the fourth um, waves of the column. Uh, so he's not just kind of sat on this ridge. Um, it's a really good ridge to be on because of the mm -hmm. the walls and the and the vines of the the vineyards. Uh, but he he does actually face new angles and new attacks. So um, I. I, it's it's probably my biggest bugbear is I always say, well, well, he wasn't only a defensive general, you know, but here he is a defensive general, but he does it really well. And right. That's a good thing too. So yeah, um, yeah I'm always going to, I'm always going to fly that flag that actually being a good defensive general is a good thing. Yeah. Um, but he, he's not only, and this is like, we see the French columns coming on. We see the British, you know, we've got the, we've got the shrapnel now. We've got the skirm, we've got good skirmishes out and it's many elements come together very well for Wellesley here. It's uh it is a well fought battle with just a bizarre aftermath, really. Yeah, and, and anytime you flick three times more casualties than you receive, you know, I think you've run a pretty good battle. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah. the what's it? The aim of the wars, you know, it's not to die for your country; it's to make the other guy die for his kind of situation. Correct. Yeah, yeah. No, Battle of Vimero, very interesting, and uh, not the last of the Peninsula War. It's more. Uh, yeah, I wonder if they had any idea, any of them, that it was going to be like a five-year slog. For actually six years yeah. to get through the peninsula yeah so it, it kind of it rounds up a lot of the 1808 actions for the british until sir john moore comes in and so uh, we start to see the corona campaign now mm. um and that's what it kind of leads to it's it's almost the end for, for the british perspective the, the spanish perspective is actually very different uh, now mm. um for this stage but it's the it's the end of stage one for the the british wells he's gone out there he's released the uh, vimero and then we start to head towards uh, the corona campaign until he comes back in the the porto campaign and then we see multiple campaigns year on year until 1814 but it does really kind of mark the end of the opening chapter in many ways if we see it's quite a, a linear book and uh, it, it sets that piece of what's set to come really right right indeed well, um, I thank you for that overview, my friend. That was very interesting, and um, hopefully my listeners enjoyed it. But yeah, Battle of Vimero, and uh, again, just one more plug. You are doing a tour of battlefields in Spain and Portugal in September, correct? Yeah, in September. So if you're listening to this 
on the anniversary. There's not much time to to book, um, but I think there's still a few places. So um, do check out on uh, dukewellington.org uh, um, the details of that. But it's being run by Classic Battlefield Tours. So get in contact with them. Uh, see if you can still get along. And uh, Vimero and Relief are two that we are going to be walking the ground. So you can you can stand in these uh, walls and the, see the ridge and imagine Juno's troops, Kellerman's men, going up these steep ridges and shrapnel raining down upon them. And I, I will take you there. Very interesting. Yeah, that sounds really fascinating. And uh, yeah, hopefully some of my listeners can join you. That'd be really neat. Yeah, well, they join me at Waterloo, so uh, right. you never know. That's right. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, again, thank you for your time, Marcus. This was great. And uh, yeah, appreciate uh, everyone joining in and listening. Thanks, everyone. And again, any questions, follow up, please uh, throw them our way and we'll do our best. Yeah, McCrib History on Twitter, correct? Yes, it is. Thanks. Yeah, no problem, my friend. You have a good one.